All right, well, good morning, everybody. Let's take our Bibles, if we could, and open them to the book of Revelation. Chapter 20 and verse 4. The title of our message this morning is, What is Wrong with Us? Question mark. You ever ask yourself that question? What is wrong with the human race? Well, God in our passage today is going to show us exactly what's wrong with us. It's a solution or or, or a diagnosis I get that you're not going to get from the medical industry or the psychological industry or the educational establishment. It's a diagnosis about the human condition that comes directly from God himself in the form of a lesson. We uh, are continuing our study through the book of Revelation, that larger section of the book, chapters 4 through 22, where John on the island of Patmos was told to write down the things which will take place after these things, the futuristic vision, if you will, of the book. So we have spent a lot of time moving from chapter 6 through chapter 19, which largely covers that time period. It involves the events of the seven-year tribulation period, where various judgments have been poured out upon the earth, and praise the Lord, we've completed that section. And so now we're in a section of the book, really the final three or so chapters of the book, where we get a description of four things that are going to happen after the tribulation is over. Those are, number one, the kingdom. Number two, the great white throne judgment. Number three, the destruction of the present earth. And then number four, the replacement of the heavens and the earth with a new heaven and new earth. If you look at our graph here and you'll see the second coming there or second advent over to the right, you'll see it sort of put together under a chart form. We've got the second coming, the kingdom, the great white throne judgment. At that point, the earth will be dissolved and then we will move into the eternal state, the new heavens and new earth. So what we are in today and last week, and I'm hoping to finish this today, but how many times have I said that and it never happened? If we don't finish it this week, we'll continue next week, but we're dealing with the kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom of Jesus Christ that will be established on planet Earth when he comes back. Are you looking forward to that? We can divide this section up as follows. Number one, we have the great chain, verses one through three. Number two, the great reign, verses four through six. And then number three, the great revolt, verses seven through 10. The first part deals with Satan. The second part deals with the saints, that's us. And the third part deals with sinners that are on the earth at the time. And where the sinners came from, we'll give you an explanation for that. So we have looked at the great chain. We saw the prisoner, Satan, verses 1 and 2, being put into a prison, verse 3, called the abyss. It's a place of incarceration where he will not be able to deceive the nations for that thousand year time period. And he's put in that abyss for a thousand years. And the last time we were together and talking about this, I tried to make the very radical case that 1,000 means what? 1,000. It's not talking about something that's happening today. It's not talking about something that's happening within the church. It's talking about something that's going to happen following the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. Robert Thomas, in his very good commentary on the book of Revelation, says no number in Revelation is verifiably a symbolic number. 
In other words, every number, you, you just take it for what it says. A thousand means a thousand. Seven churches means seven churches. Twenty-four elders means twenty-four elders. Twelve thousand from each tribe means twelve thousand from each tribe, etc. So Satan is bound during this time period. And then what begins to be described is the great reign concerning the saints. And that great reign involves two things. Number one, the resurrection of the just. First part of verse four. And number two, the rule of the just. Second part of verse four into verse six. That is beginning to describe at least that second one there, our future in Christ. But last time you remember that we took a look at the resurrection of the just. And we read these words, and they came to life. Now, this is a description of the final phase of the resurrection program. Paul, when he talked about the resurrection, analogized it to Israel's harvest cycle. Just as the Jews collected the harvest in three waves... In the same way, the resurrection for the righteous will take place in three waves. Number one, you have Jesus who rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. That's what we call first fruits. Just as first fruits guaranteed in the harvest cycle, the general harvest, Christ's resurrection guarantees our resurrection. And I hope that makes you joyful as you move into 2019. Because your destiny in Christ is to receive a resurrected, glorified body without all of the aches and pains that you are currently experiencing in your current body. So his resurrection guarantees the other resurrections. And then there was a second harvest that came in called the general harvest. You can study all of this in the Old Testament. And then the Jews were specifically told not to harvest everything in the general harvest, but to leave some for the poor. And that third harvest for the poor was called the gleanings. So just as Israel's harvest cycle took place in phases, the resurrection unto life for the believer has three phases to it. Number one, Jesus rose from the dead. That's first fruits. Number two, the general harvest is the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is for the church age believer. That would be people living on the earth even today if this should happen in our lifetime. Everyone that's trusted in Christ from the day of Pentecost to the rapture. That's part of this new man called the church or the body of Christ. We receive our resurrected bodies at the point of the rapture which precedes the tribulation period. But then you have a question, what about those people that get saved after the church is gone in the tribulation period itself? And for that matter, what about people that were saved before the church age started? Old Testament saints, Daniel, Noah, Abraham, etc. When are they going to be resurrected? Well, that's what we're reading about here in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. It says... And they came to life. And now that third phase in this cycle has been accomplished. As tribulation martyrs that are described in the prior verse have come to life and are in resurrected bodies. And Daniel 12 and verse 2 tells us that Old Testament saints will be resurrected at this particular time period. Here's what the whole thing looks like if you're interested. The Bible, all the way back in Daniel 12, verse 2, predicted that there would be two resurrections. A resurrection for the righteous, the resurrection for the unbeliever. And when we factor all of the data in, we learn that the resurrection unto life for the believer has three parts to it. Christ's resurrection, first fruits, the general harvest, that's our resurrection, at the rapture. And then there is the gleanings, that's the resurrection that we're reading about here of Old Testament saints and tribulation martyrs, and they came to life. Now one of the things that sort of occurred to me as I was driving in today and asking the Lord to help me explain some of these 
complicated issues is I started to think, well, people are going to think that we believe in soul sleep. In other words, the soul just becomes unconscious and waits for its final resurrection. And that also is not what the Bible teaches. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. He also said in Philippians 1 verses 21 through 23, for me to live is Christ, to die is what? To die is gain. He said it would actually be better for me to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. So as people die and await their resurrected body, their soul, if they're a believer, goes into the presence of the Lord. So their conscience, they're they're alive. It's very much like the consciousness and aliveness that we have right here and now. Those that are in the presence of the Lord awaiting for their resurrected body are very much alive. They just are in a state where their resurrected body has not yet been given to them. And then there'll be a terrible resurrection, which we'll see a little bit later, for unbelievers. That is a resurrection for all unbelievers of all ages. And let me tell you this, unbelievers right now are in a state of consciousness also. You'll see it very clearly described in Luke 16, verses 19 through 31, where the rich man, you remember, wanted... Lazarus to go back and warn his brothers and he wanted the moisture applied to his his tongue that describes consciousness as unbelievers one day will be taken out of that terrible place called Hades also put in resurrected bodies And as their names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life, they will be transported at the great white throne judgment from Hades into a terrible place called the lake of fire. This is why trusting Christ now is so important. Because it determines which resurrection that you will participate in. If you don't have Christ, the only thing you have to look forward to is that terrible resurrection for the unbeliever. But if you're in Christ, we look forward to that future resurrection where we will be with him in resurrected bodies. Paul, it's interesting that when he lays out this concept of resurrection sequences, doesn't just use imagery from Israel's harvest cycle, but he says this in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter. He says, each in his own order. The Greek word for order there is tagma. And many people believe, myself included, that he is analogizing the resurrection program to a Roman parade. It's interesting that when he uses first fruits, he's using a Jewish analogy, but when he uses tagma, he's using a Gentile analogy. Here's an analogy the Gentiles can understand, just as I just previously used an analogy that the Jews could understand. And tagma refers to a Roman parade. When the Romans conquered a city or a people group or won a victory or a battle, they had a parade. The parade had four stages to it. Everybody that was reading Paul and reading his words would understand these stages because it was part of their culture. There was the conquering general out front in the parade as the victor, followed by the lead officer, followed by the soldiers that were victorious in battle. And then at the end of the parade were those that had been captured, the captives in chains or cages or whatever the case may be and so when Paul says each in his own order he's saying just as a Roman parade has an order to it the resurrection program has an order to it the conquering general out front is Jesus Christ his resurrection 2,000 years ago which guarantees all the other resurrections in the chain and then the lead officer would represent the rapture of the church 
the body of Christ receiving resurrected bodies at that particular point in time before the events of the tribulation period take place. That's, the, that's your resurrection, by the way, if you're in Christ. And then the soldiers would represent the Old Testament saints and the tribulation martyrs coming to life. That's what's described there in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And then finally, the captives. That's the terrible resurrection that we're going to be reading about that takes place after the thousand years are over for the saints, excuse me, the unbelievers of all ages. And so you see all of that, believe it or not, in verse 4. But notice what verse 4 says. It goes on and it says, they not only came to life, but they reigned with Christ for how long? A thousand years. The phrase a thousand years is used six times just in these 10 verses. So not only has there been the last phase of the resurrection for the righteous, but now the righteous, which would be me, which would be you, which would be members of the church, which would also be Old Testament saints and tribulation martyrs are not just in resurrected bodies, but they are ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ, with Satan bound for a thousand years. That's our future in God. And this uh, future is hinted at many times in the teachings given earlier by Jesus. Remember what he said in Revelation 3 verse 21? To the overcomers, I'm understanding the overcomer is a believer. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. As I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So Jesus, when he ascended to the father's right hand, following the ascension, is on his father's throne. But one of these days, he's going to be on his own throne. As he's going to be transported from heaven to the earth in his second coming. And he will rule the nations of the earth from Jerusalem on his own throne for a thousand years. And what he says here is if you are an overcomer, in other words a believer, and you say, well how did you get overcomer to become believer? We went through all of that, but just jot down 1 John 5 verses 4 and 5. And you'll see it as clearly as it can be spelled out, an overcomer is a believer. Just as I am now seated on my Father's throne, the day in history will come where I will sit on my throne. And those overcomers or believers will also be sitting down with me on my throne when I rule the world for a thousand years. So if you are in Christ, there is a throne in your future. He called us in Revelation 1 verse 6, a kingdom of priests, more on that later, but he was very clear in Revelation 5 and verse 10 that what, what privilege is it to be a kingdom of priests? He says in Revelation 5 verse 10, you have made them, that's us, to be a kingdom of priests to our God and they will reign where? Upon the earth. So part of your status as a priest in Jesus Christ is the future authority that you will wield in this thousand year kingdom under his delegated authority. And so everything that's happening in your life right now is preparing you for that position. You know, you go through the the Joseph story and you look at all of the things that Joseph went through from age 17 to age 30. Until finally at age 30, he was elevated to second in command in Egypt. And you read about these things that happened to this young teenager. And you know the story, his betrayal and abuse and mistreatment. And I can tell you this, that everything that God allowed to happen to Joseph was preparing him for age 30. 
when he would be elevated to his position. So everything that's happening in our lives right now, good or bad. And by the way, we shouldn't misquote the Bible. Many people misquote the Bible and they think it says, all things are good. That is not what the Bible says. What the Bible says is God uses all things together for good to those that are called according to his purposes. Many of you are ha having things happening in your lives that are not good. Yet God is using them for good to prepare you for your future. And your future is to reign under the delegated authority in Jesus Christ for a thousand years. As one person put it, training time for reigning time. That's what's happening today. And so how important it is to never lose sight of the future that God has for us. The Corinthians had lost sight of their future. They were suing each other in front of unbelieving judges and discrediting the gospel in the process. And Paul writes to them and says in 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3, he says, or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge the angels? How much more the matters of this life? He says to the Corinthians, look, you're, you're fighting, you're backbiting, you're squabbling, and you're really not acting like the royal priesthood that you are. And you're really not acting like people that have this tremendous future. He says here, or do you not know? It's, a, it's an ignorance issue. They, they weren't aware, for some reason, of their future. And isn't it interesting that the more, you, more time you spend thinking about your future in God, the more it shapes your behavior in, your, in the present. And if, I, if I'm going to rule alongside Jesus one day as a wise person, maybe I ought to start acting like a wise person now. And maybe, you know, well, so-and-so did this to me and so-and-so did that to me. Well, given your future, maybe you ought to just let it go. And not be bitter or antagonistic or whatever the issue is going on. Whatever issue is happening in your life, tempting you to go back to the sin nature, why don't you make that a New Year's resolution for 2020? I'm just going to let it go. I'm not going to be so retaliatory. I'm not going to be so mean-spirited about things. Because what do I have to be mean-spirited about? Given this glorious future that I have in Jesus Christ. And so the world one day is not going to be like it is today. Today the Christian is not ruling and reigning. We are under the thumb of the adversary. Jesus told us in John 15 verses 18 and 19 concerning this world system. He says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. Well, gee, Pastor, I'm just not getting along well with my family. I had all these family members over for the holidays, and I just couldn't get along with them. And, and my question is, well, are you surprised by that? Well, gee, I'm working at this job over here, and I'm the only believer in the whole place. And I just am always, you know, I just don't really fit in with everybody. Does that surprise you? Jesus told us this would happen. And it wouldn't be reversed until he established his kingdom on the earth. In fact, in the present age, the Bible makes you a promise. You ready for this? And this is not one of those promises that you find at the Christian bookstores. You buy these little books today and they give you all the happy promises, which are fine to read, but here's a promise from God to you, to me, in this present age. You ready for this? It's a promise. It's ironclad. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Indeed, 
all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's their promise. You say, well, that's the most pessimistic thing I've ever heard. (laughs) But the reality of the situation is that promise is temporary. It's about to be reversed once the kingdom is established. And so not only is the resurrection of the righteous happened, but now the reign of the righteous for a thousand years is taking place. And let me tell you something, what a reign it's going to be. Revelation 20 verses 1 through 10 just tells you the length of it and adds a few details. But if you really want to understand this reign and kingdom that's coming, you have to give yourself to the Old Testament, in particular, the Old Testament prophets. Because they fill in great details that you don't find here in Revelation 20. There's coming a government on the earth that's going to be established by God. Where God's not going to sit around and be worried about the electoral college, the latest opinion polls. Oh no, they might vote me out of office. No, it's a kingdom established by God, Daniel 2 verse 44. And it's going to last forever because the thousand years is going to give way to the eternal state, which will never end. Daniel 7 verse 27, it's a time period where Jesus will rule directly Zechariah 9, 9 and 10, the direct rule of Christ present, Christ physically, visibly seated in Jerusalem, running planet earth with a rod of iron. People today are conspiring and scheming about a new world order that they want to build. Don't sign me up for that new world order. I have no interest in participating in that new world order. The only new world order I have any interest in participating is the one that Jesus ministers directly. He's going to minister it from the earth, Zechariah 14, verse 9. All of Israel's promises regarding land and prominence are going to be fulfilled. Genesis 15, 18 through 21, Isaiah 49, 22 through 23, even there'll be a functioning of a millennial temple. Ezekiel 40 through 46, even David himself will be raised and will rule under the authority of Jesus. Jeremiah 30, verse 9, it will be a rule of righteousness, no graft, no kickbacks, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, the curse will be dramatically curtailed. Isaiah 65, 20, and 22, peace will break out all over the earth. War is just sort of a curious thing that the nations used to do. Isaiah 2, verse 4, prosperity. Amos 9, 13, and 14, Isaiah 65, 22, no unemployment underemployment, layoffs, starvation, malnutrition, changes in the topography of the earth, Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12, to such an extent that even the Dead Sea is going to come back to life biologically. And then Isaiah, that's in Ezekiel 47, and then Isaiah 65 verse 24 talks about immediate answers to prayer. Gone are the days where we pray and we get no answer because many times we pray outside of the will of God. Before the very words are on our mouth, God will answer that prayer. Isaiah 65 verse 24. Well, gee, pastor, this is great teaching. Is this really orthodox? I mean, is this really what Christians believe? Because I just went to the church down the street and the pastor over there gave me a totally different way of thinking about it. And, I, and you're, you're very literal in the way you approach this. And I just don't know if you're right. Notice Justin Martyr who wrote in AD 160. This would be the first two centuries of the church. He says, but I and every other completely orthodox Christian feel certain, not maybe it's going to happen, 
that there will be a resurrection of the flesh, just talked about that, followed by a thousand years in the rebuilt and embellished and enlarged city of Washington, D.C., doesn't say that, city of Jerusalem, as was announced by the prophets Ezekiel, we just read some of his prophecies, and Isaiah and the others. Justin Martyr, in the first two centuries of the church concerning this future kingdom, says we all believe it. And if you don't believe it, you're not even considered an orthodox Christian. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. This future kingdom, I don't see it in the Nicene Creed. I don't see it in the Apostles' Creed. I mean, if this is so crystal clear, how come it doesn't show up in the great ecumenical creeds of the church? You don't need to write a creed when everybody believes the same thing. There's no need for a creed. There's no need for a confession. You only write a creed when a heretic comes in and challenges something in Christianity. That's what this man Arius did, who began to say that Jesus was a created being which is basically what the Jehovah's Witnesses will say to you at your door, not if they come, but when they come. They'll try to argue that Jesus was not eternally existent. Jesus is a created being. And what they're doing is they're recycling the heresies of Arius. And so the Creed of Nicaea, when it says, there's a clause in it, begotten and not made, was designed to correct the Arian heresy. That's why creeds exist. But in the first two centuries of the church, what, what, there was no, nobody challenging this. Everybody believed this to a man. That's why this doctrine of the kingdom doesn't show up in the great creeds and confessions of the faith, which are designed to challenge heretics. And so everybody believed this for 200 years. It wasn't until Augustine in the 4th century that introduced sort of a non-spiritual method of interpretation that the idea got challenged. But pre-Augustine, the first two centuries of Christianity, whether it's Justin Martyr or any church father you want to summon and read the writings, all believed exactly what I'm saying. Jesus is coming back. His feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. He's going to establish a kingdom for a thousand years. Satan will be bound. The Old Testament prophecies will reach their fulfillment. And the resurrected righteous will reign under the delegated authority of Jesus Christ for a thousand years. And if you don't believe that for two centuries, then we might as well say you're not even a Christian. We continue on and it talks this way in verse 5. The rest of the dead. Now who would those be? Unbelievers. Where are they? They're in Hades. Place of conscious torment. Awaiting their future resurrected bodies because they'll be resurrected too. Only to experience the wrath of God in that resurrected body the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed this is the first resurrection so this terrible resurrection for the unsaved is not going to happen for a thousand years there's a thousand year time period between the last phase of the resurrection for the righteous and the resurrection for the unrighteous. Paul the Apostle, you remember, uses the word tagma, each in his own order. And part of the order was the captives. Who are the captives? The unsaved of all ages. When are they going to be resurrected? At the end of this thousand year time period. So isn't it interesting that when Daniel describes these, these resurrections, he doesn't give you an indication that there's a thousand years between them. 
Daniel simply says many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. You'll notice that Daniel doesn't tell you that there's a thousand years between those two resurrections. You have to consult the book of Revelation to get that information. Which is exactly how Bible prophecy works. Because Daniel himself could not see many things between the mountain peaks. We might analogize Bible prophecy to this. You look into the distance and you see a mountain. And then more closer to you, you see another mountain that's slightly lower in terms of height. And so you can see those two mountains, but what, you, what can you not see? You can't see the valley in between the mountains. You see, Daniel could see the two resurrections, but he couldn't see the thousand years between those two resurrections. Bible prophecy does this over and over again. In fact, this was on all of your Christmas cards, was it not? Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. And we all know what that's talking about, right? It's the first advent of Jesus Christ. No problem. But then you read the next sentence and it says the government will rest upon his shoulders. Have you seen the people that are running our government today? And then it says there'll be no end end to the increase of his government or peace or the throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness forevermore. And the temptation people have is you just go to verse 7 and you just say, well, that's not literal. Well, then why is verse 6 literal? I mean, if verse 6 is literal, it's on all of our Christmas cards, so it's got to be literal. A child will be born to us. Why wouldn't everything else in the passage be literal as well? So Isaiah could see the two comings of Christ, but he couldn't see the valley between the two comings. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, Jesus actually quotes this in the synagogue at Nazareth. He quotes verse 1, he quotes verse 2, but he left something out. The day of vengeance of our God. You'll see the quote in Luke 14, 16 through 21. Quotes verse 1, quotes most of verse 2, but then he leaves out the day of vengeance of our God. Why would he leave that out? And then he says in the Luke passage, today, very bottom, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, why would he leave out the last clause there? Because that last clause relates not to his first coming, but his what? His second coming. Well, why doesn't Isaiah just tell us that between right in the middle of verse 2 is a comma that's going to last 2,000 years? Why why doesn't Isaiah tell us that? Because Isaiah couldn't see it. That's why. You have to consult subsequent revelation to fit all of this together. It's, It's just like a jigsaw puzzle. That's what it is. You've seen jigsaw puzzles, no doubt, this holiday season. Some of your kids or grandkids got jigsaw puzzles. Maybe you got one yourself. And those are a lot of fun. As long as you've got the box top, it tells you what the picture looks like. They're miserable if you have no idea what the picture looks like. But you look at the box top and you say, here's what it's supposed to look like. Oh, yeah, this piece fits here. And this piece fits over there. And if you put a little energy into it, you can put the whole thing together by consulting the box top. What's your box top? This is your box top. You've got a completed canon and you can look back and say, oh, okay, that applies to the first coming. That over there applies to the second coming. In fact, there's a gap right in the middle of Daniel 2 verses 40 and 41, right in the middle of the ankles and the feet is at least 2,600 years. There's a gap right in the middle of Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. There's a gap right between Daniel 9, verse 26, and Daniel 9, 27. There's even a gap right in the middle of Daniel 11, verse 35, and Daniel 11, verse 36. 
So Daniel could see these two great resurrections. He really couldn't see, though, the thousand years between them. So we have to consult the book of Revelation, which makes us aware of this thousand-year time period. The resurrection of the righteous, the final phase of it, has been accomplished and fulfilled. The righteous are ruling and reigning alongside Jesus Christ in their glorified bodies. All of the prophecies that God said would happen in the kingdom are happening for a thousand years. Satan is not even around to bother anybody. But when the thousand years are over, the unrighteous, currently in a place called Hades, a place of conscious torment, are summoned and brought forth and stand before the Lord in resurrected bodies to have their trial at what is called the great white throne judgment, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Verse 5 continues, it says, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Now, we have a lot of people today that deny the rapture. There will be no rapture, they say. There will be no rapture of the church where the church receives resurrected bodies at the top of the screen there before the seven-year tribulation period even starts. And why would they say that? Because in verse 5, it says the first resurrection. And if the rapture has already taken place, it wouldn't say the first resurrection. It would say the second resurrection. You got to be very careful with this word first. First in the Bible doesn't mean first ever. Now, some contexts it can mean that. But that's what it that's not what it means here. Because if this, the final phase of the resurrection unto life for the righteous, tribulation saints, Old Testament saints, is the very first resurrection ever, then who else never rose? The church never rose and Jesus never rose. Now we got a problem. Because if Jesus never rose, you don't have Christianity. Christianity rides or falls according to the historical accounting of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So first here can't mean first ever, because if it means first ever, then you don't even have a resurrected Jesus. So first here, what does it mean? It means first in relationship to the terrible resurrection coming later after the thousand years are over. It's first in a sequence of two, not first ever. It's like when my wife, she says, she, she texts me or calls me on the phone. She says, I want you to run some errands for me. First, I want you to go to the la pick up the laundry. Last, I want you to go to the store and pick up whatever, groceries. Now, when she calls me and gives me those instructions, I don't say to myself, well, praise the Lord. Once I go to the grocery store, I'll never have to do it again. Because she's using last, not last ever, but last in relation to first. See that? When she says, I want you to pick up the laundry, I don't say, well, this is interesting. This is the first time in our whole marriage I've ever picked up the laundry. Now, if you talk to her, she might think that's true, but we won't go into that. <laughs> it's first and last in a sequence. You see that? Not first ever. So he says the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection, the, the resurrection, the last phase of it. The soldiers, not the soldiers, the, let me go back to my chart here. Unfortunately, it's way back. There we go. The soldiers, there we go. And the gleanings has happened. You've already been resurrected. You're returning with Jesus to rule and reign. The resurrection unto righteous has happened. It's been fulfilled. The only thing left is the terrible resurrection of the unrighteous, which is going to take place 1,000 years later. And we continue on, and we come to verse 6, and notice what it says. 
Blessed, now that's the Greek word makarios. It's the same word used over and over again in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus will say, blessed are the peacemakers, etc. Same word. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Look at that word holy. Did you know that's what you are in Christ? You're holy. You say, well, you didn't see the family food fight we got into. And the cantankerous nation, uh, cantankerous holiday spirit at our house this Christmas. And you're looking at your holiness through the wrong grid. You don't look at it through your own self. If you spend your life looking at yourself all the time, you're going to be very depressed. You know, I watch all of these, uh, you know, self-empowerment type people and psychologists on TV, and they're always talking about yourself. You've got to get in touch with yourself. You've got to be your better self. And they've got a self magazine, and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking that's the most depressing subject I could contemplate. I don't want to think about myself. What I want to think about is what Jesus transferred to me at the point of faith. His righteousness was transferred to me at the point of faith. God the Father looks at me as if I'm just as righteous as his son. You say, well, pastor, I don't always act like it. Well, what does that have to do with anything? It's a positional legal reality. You say, well, shouldn't this affect our daily life? Yes, it should. We ought to let our practice catch up with what? Our position. I mean, if we're holy, and that's what it says right there, maybe I should act like it. But whether I act like it or don't act like it doesn't change the positional truth. It's a doctrine called imputation, which means transfer. And it says this, blessed makarios and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Now, I pointed out makarios, blessed, because in the book of Revelation, there are seven beatitudes. You say, well, wait a minute, I thought those were in the book of Matthew. They are, but here's another set of seven. I mean, is there anybody in here that does not want to be blessed? Put your hand up. We all want to be blessed. And the book of Revelation gives us seven blessings. Number one, and it's all the word markarios. Number one, Revelation 1 verse 3. A blessing is promised upon the reader and the heater of the book of Revelation. If you'll read it and take it to heart, God says you're blessed. I mean, you're blessed simply by showing up this morning and listening to this because it demonstrates that you take the book of Revelation seriously. Number two, for those in the tribulation period, there's a blessing upon the martyrs because if you die, you're not under the oppression of the Antichrist anymore. You're in the presence of who? God. Revelation 14, verse 13. Number three, there's a blessing upon those in the events of the book of Revelation that are spiritually prepared for the coming of Christ. Revelation 16, verse 15. What gets you ready for the second coming of Christ? It is the holiness that is transferred to you at the point of faith. If you don't have that holiness through imputation or transfer, you don't have much to look forward to. But if you've got that and you receive it by faith alone, then you're blessed. Number four, there is a blessing, markarios, pronounced upon those who are going to participate in the marriage supper of the Lamb. We read about that in Revelation 19, verse 9. Markarios is used to describe those invited to that. And by the way, if you're in Christ, there's an evite in your inbox inviting you to that supper. 
Number five, I'll skip and go back to. Number six, there's a blessing once again upon this time, not just the reader of the book of Revelation, but someone who takes it seriously, a heater, Revelation 22, verse seven. And number seven, there is a blessing promised upon those that are gonna enter the eternal city. Revelation 22, verse 14. And by the way, unlike the United States of America, this city's going to have borders. <laughs> where not everybody's getting in. And what gets you in? The transferred righteousness of Christ. That's your passport. You don't have the transferred righteousness of Christ, you can't enter. And by the way, that city's going to be awesome. Paul tells us in Philippians 3 verse 20 that our citizenship is where? In heaven. Why would he say that? It's the city that was in existence. I think it was in existence, I'm going to try to make this case, when Paul was on the earth. It's just not fit to come down yet because we live on a corrupted earth and a city like that wouldn't fit well on a corrupted earth. You're dealing with two things that don't go together. But one of these days, this earth is going to be dissolved. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, by fire. 2 Peter 3, verse 10. By the way, that's where you put your global warming. 2 Peter 3, verse 10. Everybody's worried about global warming. People say, people call the church, do you believe in global warming? Yes, we do. It's in 2 Peter 3, verse 10, where God takes this terrestrial ball and dissolves it by fire and replaces it with a new heavens and new earth, never marred or touched by sin. And now that city, which has been up there since the days of the Apostle Paul, at least, can come down to that earth. And that's your eternal home. So there's a blessing pronounced upon people that will enter that city. Now, what else is there a blessing upon? We skip number five. You'll notice in verse six, a blessing is pronounced upon the participants in the first resurrection. What does it say there in verse six? Blessed Markarios and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Now, why is that? Two reasons are given, both in verse 6. Number one, over these, the second death has no power. You see, if you're part of the resurrection program of God and you are part of the resurrection unto righteousness, yours is at the rapture. Old Testament saints and tribulation martyrs is at the beginning of the millennial kingdom, then folks involved in that resurrection are considered blessed. Why? Because the second death has no power over them. Now, the first time the second death is mentioned in the book of Revelation, it's mentioned in Revelation 2, verse 11, where Jesus, speaking to one of the churches, I think this was Smyrna, said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes, by the way, who's an overcomer? A believer. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. And you don't get an explanation of what the second death is until you go over to Revelation 20, verse 14. It says that then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. The second death is the resurrection of the unrighteous at the end of the thousand years. And as they stand trial at what is called the great white throne judgment, they are transported from Hades into the lake of fire. It's not something that you'd ever want to participate in. It's not something that you would want anybody that you love to participate in. In fact, that's the reason why we evangelize people and share the gospel week after week for the simple reason that we are trying to keep people out of the second death. Here's a, a little statement that has helped me over the years. If you're born once, you'll die twice. 
If you're born twice, you'll die once. I mean, think about that. If I'm born physically into the world, but I've never ever in my life trusted in Christ as my Savior, what is my future exactly? Two deaths, physical, and then eventually being cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Conversely, if I'm born twice... What does that mean? Born physically into the world, but I've received Christ as my Savior, and I'm born spiritually. We talked about that in our Christmas Eve message, regeneration, the new birth. Then the very worst thing that can happen to me is I could physically die. And beloved, that might not even happen either, because we could be the rapture generation. If we are, and I can't promise that we are, death is not in your future at all. But if we're not the rapture generation, the very worst thing that could happen to you is physical death. Absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. And the lake of fire is not in your future at all. Luke 10 verse 17 says this. This was Jesus sending out the 70. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Luke 10, verse 17. Luke 10, verse 20. Jesus responding, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Don't rejoice at the size of your house or the size of your ministry or your 401k plan, which might be a 201k plan or whatever it is, don't rejoice in the fact that you're a United States citizen. Now, don't get me wrong. Those are all things to rejoice in. But that's not what Jesus says here. He says, if you really want to rejoice in something, Rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven and that you have no part in this coming second death or lake of fire. That's why it says, verse 6, Markarios, blessed is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. Be joyful about that. Be joyful about your eternal position in Christ. And why else are those who participate in the first resurrection, why should they rejoice? What does it say? Why are they considered blessed? But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. You see, if you participate in this first resurrection, you're considered blessed for two reasons. A, you've got no place in the lake of fire. And number two, your status as a priest is about to be actualized. It's about to be fulfilled. Because when God made you a priest, and isn't it interesting, in the Old Testament, not everybody could be a priest, You had to come from which line in the Old Testament? Levi and from Aaron's line within Levi. Only those descending from Aaron within the tribe of Levi could be called priests. Is it not interesting that in the age of the church that we're all priests? Doesn't he say that in Revelation 1 verse 6? He has made us to be a kingdom of priests. You say, well, who cares? What's the big deal? Because your status as a priest is gives you authority in the next age. Revelation 5 verse 10 fills out the meaning of being a priest. You have made them, us, to be a kingdom of priests and they will what? Reign, the verb is future, the reigning is not now, the training is now. The training is in preparation for the reigning. But one of these days, your status as a priest that you now have is about to be fulfilled. It's about to be actualized. And you will reign. Where exactly are you going to reign from? 
sitting on a cloud strumming a harp, right? It's not what the Bible says. They will reign upon where? The earth. Well, why can't we reign upon the earth now? Because Satan hasn't been evicted yet. That's what the various judgments in the book of Revelation are accomplishing. Satan's grip is being loosened over the planet. He's not evicted until Jesus comes back and puts him in a place called the abyss. Then Jesus will take his seat on David's throne. His thousand year kingdom will start and you're a part of it. Why are you a part of it? Because of what God has decreed, declared about you as a priest. And for two centuries of Christianity, this is what they all taught. And this is what they all believed. Because it comes right out of the pages of God's word. And then something happens at the end of this thousand years called the revolt. Verses 7 through 10. The revolt has four parts to it. The adversary, verse 7, the apostasy, verse 8, the attack on the city of Jerusalem, verse 9a, and finally the annihilation of Satan, 9b, second half of the verse, into verse 10. And that's the part I was hoping to get to today. (laughs) See, everything we've done thus far is introduction. Because the new people are saying, what in the world is going on at this church? And our response is just hang with us a little bit and you'll get used to it. Because the title of this sermon was, what is wrong with us? So obviously I can't talk about what's wrong with us without talking about this revolt. So the title of next week's sermon is going to be, what is wrong with us, part two. Is that okay? But the reality of the situation is there's, there's, you know, one of the things I like about the Bible is it just is black and white. And the message of today is what resurrection do you want to be part of? I frankly am a path of least resistance kind of guy. And I want to be in the resurrection where I'm blessed. I don't want anything to do with that terrible resurrection at the end of the thousand years. And what keeps me in resurrection A and not in resurrection B is a simple word called believe. It's not believe that, it's believe in. You're believing in someone, Jesus, who entered history, who stepped out of eternity into time to pay a price in his body for our sins that we could never pay. And then he, as first fruits, rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, guaranteeing our resurrection as well. And he leaves humanity with the very simple message entrusted to the church, trust in what I've done for you. Don't try to fix yourself. Don't try to be better. Don't make your flesh try harder. Receive what I've done as a gift. And you receive something as a gift from God only one way, which is to believe. Because the book of Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, says to the one who does not work but believes. Did you catch that? To the one who does not work but believes, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. In other words, you're tied in to all of these glorious future promises, not by working for salvation, but by receiving it as a gift by faith. When you received Christmas presents or gave out Christmas presents, you didn't give a gift to somebody of an expensive nature and then tell them you need to start making payments on it. Because that's not a gift. The moment you think you have to start making payments on what Jesus has done for you through good works, it's, it loses its status as a gift. We can't receive what we've been talking about here through self-effort. 
It's got to be received as a gift. And if a person won't receive it as a gift, they don't, receive, they don't participate. So our exhortation is the Holy Spirit convicts people of their need to do this, is to trust in what Jesus has done. It's not a matter of joining a church, walking an aisle, filling out a card, giving money. It's not a matter of New Year's resolutions. It's about trusting, which means relying upon what Jesus has done for you. And that's something that you can do now, even as I'm speaking in the quietness of your own heart, as the Spirit places you under conviction through a moment of privacy between you and the Lord. It can happen right now. Your whole destiny can change. And if it's something you need more explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for what we have in Christ and we're grateful for the future that we have in Christ and the promises that we have. Help us, Father, to live in light of these promises, even in troubled times, knowing that there's a better world coming. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.